Hello YouTube! In this video I'm going to look at an argument for moral realism that appeals to convergence on moral values. Uh, if you don't know what moral realism is, well I, I have plenty of videos on meta-ethics so uh, you can go and check them out, I will link them in the description. Um, but basically moral realism is the view that moral judgments, such as slavery is wrong, uh, these moral judgments express beliefs and that these beliefs are true or false in virtue of stance-independent moral facts. Uh, moral facts are discovered, not invented. Uh, it, is, it is a fact that slavery is wrong, um, and uh, even if everybody believed that it was acceptable, they would be incorrect about this. Now, a classic objection to moral realism appeals to moral disagreement. Uh, so when we look at other cultures, we find radically different moral values, and it seems that there isn't any clear way of determining who is right when moral values clash. Um, I've done a couple of videos examining moral disagreement and how it might pose a challenge to moral realism. Again, I will post those videos in the comments. Now, uh, at this point, uh, the moral realist may well go on the offensive. So we don't just find moral disagreement, we also see increasing agreement about moral matters. So over the course of human history, there has been increasing convergence onto a particular set of moral values. And the moral realist may argue that the best explanation for this convergence is that people are converging on the moral facts. We are becoming increasingly good at detecting the moral facts. So by comparison, consider the increasing convergence on beliefs about cosmology, for instance. When we look at societies throughout human history, we find a wide range of views about the origin and structure of the cosmos. There's the flat earth model, there's the, the Aristotelian model with a spherical earth, um, that has the sun and the planets revolving around it attached to the celestial spheres. Uh, in Jain cosmology, the universe is uncreated, it has existed for an eternity, and it is structured into three parts. It's broad at the top, narrow in the middle, and broad again at the bottom. Um, and, and so on, you know, all sorts of different models of the cosmos have been proposed um, in different societies. Today, all educated people agree that the Earth orbits the Barry centre of the solar system, that the Sun is on the edge of one galaxy among trillions, that the universe is expanding and so on. Uh, it seems that all people are converging on one particular theory of cosmology. You know, so you look across all sorts of different societies and you find this this specific theory, uh, where the Earth is orbiting the centre of the solar system, the Sun is on the edge of a galaxy, you, know, you find that theory accepted across all societies. What explains this convergence? Well, the obvious explanation is that we're getting better at discovering the facts about the universe. So, although there is plenty of moral disagreement, we also find increasing moral agreement over time. And the realist might suggest that the best explanation for this increasing agreement is that we are discovering the moral facts. This argument has been made in detail by Michael Humer in the article A Liberal Realist Answer to Debunking Skeptics. Humer argues that there has been a trend towards convergence on liberal values. Now, liberalism, as Humer defines it, involves three commitments. So, first of all, uh, liberalism affirms the moral equality of persons. All persons are, in some important sense, granted equal consideration. We do not discriminate on the basis of race or ethnicity or gender or sexual orientation. Um, second, liberalism promotes respect for the dignity of the individual. It recognises that all individuals have some degree of autonomy or freedom, or at least they, they should be granted some, you know, control over their own lives. Third, it opposes gratuitous coercion or violence. Uh, it it favours societies that are built on peace and trade and cooperation. Um, uh, now, this, of course, is a, a very broad, vague characterization. It covers a host of different ethical views. Uh, the vast majority of ethicists today would identify as liberal in this broad sense. Still, Humer says that there is a coherent and actually fairly specific ethical perspective here. Um, these three commitments are kind of interconnected. It is because persons are moral equals that we should respect the dignity of other individuals and not engage in coercion and violence against them without good reason. Um, 
So this is a, a kind of harmonious, coherent uh, perspective. Um, and it's a perspective which is becoming increasingly common. Um, so let's consider some examples of convergence on liberalism. First of all, over human history, there has been a significant decline in violence. Uh, death by homicide was extremely common among hunter-gatherers. Uh, in hunter-gatherer societies, between 10 to 30% of all deaths were homicide, mostly during tribal warfare. So warfare was very, has been a very common feature of human history. This is a chart showing estimates of the percentage of death by war in contemporary hunter-gatherer societies based on ethnographic work by uh, anthropologists. Compare that to Europe and the US at the bottom. Uh, far, far lower percentage of deaths by war. Um, and here is a chart uh, showing estimates of the percentage uh, of deaths by violence in various prehistoric societies based on an examination of human remains from anthropological sites. Again, that's compared with uh, Europe and the US uh, at the bottom there. Um, so uh, so it, it looks like, you know, it looks like there's been a, uh, a pretty ma pretty massive decline in, uh, in war and violence, at least between hunter-gatherer societies and uh, uh, the, the modern Western societies. Um, similarly, civilizations of the past, um, uh, in in civilizations in civilizations of the past, uh, they were extremely violent towards other civilizations relative to modern societies. So, um, in the past, violence and aggression were considered honourable, even glorious. Conquerors such as Alexander the Great were heroes of their time. War was often seen as a tool to make men stronger. Um, in the more distant past, it was common for people to favour outright destruction of other civilizations. Uh, now. You know, over time, we see attitudes changing. So by the 18th and 19th centuries, uh, you couldn't just go around like obliterating other people and stealing from them, um, or at least you couldn't do that openly. New justifications had to be found for colonialism and imperialism. Um, of course, uh, you know, <laughs> civilizations still engaged in these behaviours, but they had to find um, other means of justifying them. So colonialism was sometimes justified on paternalistic grounds. The argument was that European countries can legitimately take control over other countries uh, ostensibly to improve the conditions of the colonised country. So it's like, you know, the, the Europe is the sort of force of civilization. It, it, it's going to civilise the barbarous countries. Now, in the modern world, uh, we value respect for the self-determination of other peoples. Uh, of course, in practice, there's still plenty of interference with other societies, but the point is that there is a general trend, or at least there seems to be a general trend towards peaceful coexistence. Um, not just relations between societies, but also the behaviour of people within each society have become more peaceful. The murder rate in Europe declined from about 35 per 100,000 in 1300 to just 3 per 100,000 today. This chart shows the homicide rates since 1300 in various European countries. Um, moreover, in the past, many more behaviours were seen as acceptable reasons for killing. Duels would be fought simply because one person insulted another, or consider the far greater range of crimes that merited the death penalty. Theft, blasphemy, sodomy, adultery, witchcraft. Um, and then many of these execution methods were intentionally brutal. Boiling, flaying, starvation, crucifixion. Torture was accepted as, as a means of investigating crimes. Slavery was once common and widely accepted. Indeed, not just accepted, it was actively promoted as morally good by the moral authorities of the past. Today, it's illegal in almost all countries. There is increasing egalitarianism. Uh, we treat people as individuals rather than discriminating against them on the basis of race, gender or sexual orientation. So think about women's rights. For much of the history of Western countries, women were explicitly viewed as inferior. They were denied legal rights. They were barred from many professions. Men were granted power over the lives and bodies of women. For instance, up to the 17th century in England, any property held by a woman at the time of her marriage became property of her husband. Violence against women, such as rape, was primarily viewed as a crime against the husband or the father, uh, rather than against the woman herself. Today, 
nobody defends these policies. Like nobody, no, 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 nobody would be taken seriously if they if they tried to uh, promote such uh, such values. There is increasing democratization. Most governments of the past were monarchies or dictatorships. Over the past couple of hundred years, democracy has spread across the globe. Um, so these are just a few examples, um, and you know these examples can be multiplied. They illustrate the point: there has been a general trend towards liberal values, or so Humor argues. Anyway, this trend has been occurring since the start of human civilization, and it accelerated with the Industrial Revolution, and it seems to be occurring across the entire globe. Humor describes this trend as, and I quote, "among the most striking and important phenomena in human history." As such, it cries out for explanation. How do we explain this? Right? Why? Why did this happen? Well, uh, the moral realist has an answer. So, um, humour summarises the moral realist's explanation, uh, and I quote: "Why was slavery abolished? Because slavery was unjust. Why have human beings become increasingly reluctant to go to war? Because war is horrible. Why has liberalism in general triumphed in human history?" because liberalism is correct. Basically, we have become better at discovering the moral facts, just as we have become better at discovering the facts about cosmology, biology, chemistry, um, and you know many other domains. So humour proposes a sort of five-stage explanation for moral convergence. Um, and this explanation is intended to show that societies have developed uh, reliable methods for forming moral beliefs. So, first point. Human beings, Humor argues, have a general capacity for a priori knowledge. By a priori knowledge, we mean knowledge that is independent of experience. So, not knowledge that does not depend on empirical evidence. For example, many philosophers take it that our knowledge of mathematics is a priori. I know that 1 plus 1 equals 2, but this knowledge is not based on my sensory experiences. 1 plus 1 equals 2 is, it, it is necessarily true. Uh, it would be true no matter what my experiences were like. Nobody could develop an empirical scientific theory that would convince us that 1 plus 1 does not equal 2. And, and we didn't need any kind of scientific theory to, to develop this knowledge, right? Like, so this is the point. It's, it's just, it seems to be completely independent of our experience of the world. Uh, similarly, consider the proposition, if Sydney is taller than Verity, then Verity is shorter than Sydney. It seems that no observation or experiment is required to know that this is true. As long as you understand the meanings of the words in this proposition, you just you can just see it must be true. Um, like you, you, I mean, yeah, it's just it's just obvious, right? And it doesn't actually matter how tall Sydney or Verity are, right? You can see that this that the logical relations between the concepts are such that this proposition must be true. So, regardless of how tall uh, of what their actual height is, if Sydney is taller than Verity, then Verity is shorter than Sydney. Um, so we have some general capacity for a priori knowledge knowledge that is independent of experience. We might call this capacity reason, or intuition, or understanding, or the intellect, but we have this capacity. Now, the notion of a priori knowledge is puzzling, right? So, you know, there are lots of difficult epistemological questions here. How exactly do we have access to truths that are independent of experience? Um, <laughs> you know, that's a, that's a difficult problem. But it's also very difficult to account for knowledge in various domains without uh, some sort of capacity for a priori knowledge. Our knowledge of mathematics, of logic, of probability, of possibility and necessity, of various truths of metaphysics, much of this seems to be a priori knowledge. Um, second, the moral realist can kind of piggyback on this account. So, as humour sees it, morality is not and cannot be an empirical science. Our knowledge of certain basic moral values is a priori. So, for instance, we know that torturing innocent people is wrong, but we don't discover this by making observations or performing experiments. Um, I mean, we might need to do empirical research in order to determine how best to realise our moral values. So we might ask what sort of policies would be most effective at 
reducing torture. Um, but the, the basic moral value itself, the wrongness of torturing innocent people, this is known not through observation, but through some sort of a priori moral intuition. Um, and, you know, the capacity for moral intuition is puzzling. What exactly is it? How does it work? How did we come to be furnished with it? Well, what humour wants to say is that whatever the faculty is that allows us knowledge of other a priori truths, such as the truth of mathematics and truths of logic, this faculty also allows us knowledge of moral truths. So we form moral beliefs using the same mechanism by which we form beliefs about other a priori domains. And we can know that this faculty is reliable, even if we don't know exactly how it works, right? Like clearly we have, you know, reliable knowledge of mathematical truths. So whatever capacity it is that allows us that knowledge, this same capacity can give us knowledge of the moral truths. Third, there are various non-rational influences on the formation of moral beliefs. There are emotions and attitudes that are the product of self-interest or evolutionary history or idiosyncratic cultural practices. So consider the belief that one's own children are special, that, you know, like, my children are more important than the children of others. Well, that just seems obviously to be an arbitrary bias. Um, and there's, an, there's a very obvious evolutionary explanation for why human beings would have this bias, because uh, those of our ancestors who favoured their own offspring were more likely to promote the reproduction of their genes, right? So very straightforward uh, explanation for why humans would have a bias in favour of their own offspring. Similarly, consider the belief that one's own society is better than other societies, or that it is, it is good if one's own society conquers other societies and takes their resources, but it's bad if other societies conquer one's own society. Again, that's, that just seems clearly to be an arbitrary bias, um, and there are pretty obvious explanations for why people might have that bias. Um, so uh, there, are, there are all sorts of these kind of non-rational biases that influence moral beliefs, and morality is not unique in this respect. In, in all domains, people are subject to biases. Think about the many biases that distort our reasoning about probability. You know, the gambler's fallacy, the base rate fallacy, the conjunction fallacy. Um, many results from probability theory are counterintuitive, but we can see that they're correct through reasoning. You know, once we kind of, we, we, we think, we, right, we think through it and we can overcome our bias. But the point is, there are biases. So it's unsurprising that people are similarly subject to bias in the moral domain. Fourth, um, culture very strongly influences an individual's moral beliefs. It's very rare that a person will adopt moral beliefs that are strongly at variance with those of her culture. Um, but it's quite common for people to hold beliefs that are slightly at variance. In any culture, there are frequent moral disagreements. They're not usually major disagreements. Again, you know, it's, it's, it's rare that somebody is going to go kind of in a completely different direction to their culture. Um, but there's lots of disagreements um, with respect to uh, uh, more specific sort of moral debates. Fifth, people differ in their susceptibility to the non-rational influences and biases uh, that, that might um, affect their beliefs. So some people will be, be will be better able to see past their emotional and cultural biases than others. Uh, again, that's just what we find in other domains. People differ in their ability to overcome biases in reasoning about probability. People differ in their ability to, you know, see the way that their beliefs about cosmology, say, belief in the existence of God, might be subject to non-rational influences. So <clears throat> with these points in mind, we can give the realist explanation for convergence on liberal norms. In the distant past, humans were badly mistaken about the moral facts, just as they were badly mistaken about many other facts. In particular, people were led astray due to non-rational emotions and desires. Moral beliefs were strongly influenced by self-interest, by drives that were inculcated by evolutionary pressures, and by, you know, just, just weird cultural practices. So many sources of bias. Now, liberalism 
uh, explicitly reject such biases. This is the point of the liberal commitment to the moral equality of persons. So if I am to impose violence on other persons, or if I am to discount their interests, you know, if I'm to say like, well, I'm, I'm just, I, I don't care, like, w w you know, what this person wants out of their life, I'm just going to enslave them, um, or something like that. If I'm going to do this, that sort of thing, liberalism requires that I find some sort of relevant difference between us. You know, it can't simply be that the victim is a member of a different society to me, or a member of a different race to me. So, you know, liberal, what, the way that you get to liberalism is by overcoming these sorts of these sorts of arbitrary biases. Um, the result of overcoming arbitrary biases would be a convergence on liberalism. Um, so at any given time, Humer says, there will be some individuals who can see some of the moral errors um, that result from such biases. Now, since an individual's culture has a significant influence on her moral attitudes, it's going to be quite rare that any individual will see all of the moral errors. But it's just that their moral attitudes will align slightly more closely with the actual moral facts. So there's going to be some individuals who are able to sort of see through some of the biases. Uh, Humor gives the example of John Locke. John Locke was a moral reformer. He promoted tolerance towards other religions. Locke took it to be wrong to discriminate against people or to act with violence against people simply due to their religious beliefs. But he didn't promote atheism, uh, or at least he didn't promote tolerance of atheism. Uh, he thought that atheism would undermine moral norms. So, I quote, Promises, covenants and oaths, which are the bonds of human society, can have no hold upon the atheist. So says Locke. Um, but, I mean, so notice that even Locke's reason for intolerance towards atheism is an expression of liberal values. So it's not that atheists are to be persecuted simply because they hold what he saw as incorrect beliefs. It's because he thought they would undermine the social contract. They would undermine. Uh, they would undermine moral norms. Um, now Locke was mistaken about about this, um, and he made this mistake partly because he couldn't see past the prejudice and ignorance of his own society. Um, so this is the sort of this is what generally happens, right? Like people are able to see through some of the biases, but not all of them. Now, uh, when a person attempts to reform the moral norms of their society, they will often cause other people who had not previously reflected on these norms to question them, to question the norms. And Humer says that the push for liberal reforms tends to be effective, uh, at least in the long run, for two reasons. Firstly, because liberal reformers will have below average levels of bias. They tend to be more rational than the status quo. So they tend to prevent, they tend to present more persuasive arguments. Um, furthermore, liberal reformers will tend to occupy influential positions. The ability to detect error and bias and to eliminate it from one's own reasoning is correlated with intelligence, and intelligence is correlated with social influence. We find that intelligent people are more likely to become, you know, authors, public intellectuals, politicians, they're more likely to be people of high, high social status who could influence their societies. So <clears throat> there are forces that push each society towards the correct liberal values. Um, and over time, liberal reforms will accumulate. You know, Locke was successful in encouraging tolerance of alternative religious ideas. But then it can become clear to the next generation that the very arguments for toleration of other religious views should also extend to toleration of atheism. So we build on the reform of the, we build on the reforms of the past. Okay, that's the general picture. Moral facts are known in the same way that we know other a priori truths. There are many biases that influence our moral beliefs, which is why people were badly mistaken in the past. But as with other a priori domains, societies tend in the long run to overcome such biases. This explains why we see convergence on liberalism. People are becoming better at overcoming bias and detecting the moral facts. So this is the realist's explanation for convergence on liberal values. Okay, uh, let's turn to some objections. <clears throat> 
So a first objection uh, is that we might dispute Humer's historical claim. So on Humer's picture, history shows this general trend towards liberalism, right? Humanity begins with extremely illib illiberal values, values influenced by, you know, self-interest and evolutionary pressures. And then gradually, you know, over the, cor over the course of human history, um, humans come to converge on liberalism. I mean, of course, there are some setbacks and so on, but the general trend is basically universal. Um, but this is questionable. So, uh, I mean, you know, the, the, I, I, this would like require really a, a whole video in itself to, to discuss the history here, but I'll, I'll just consider a couple of brief points. So, one point is, well, we might argue that actually hunter-gatherer societies events fairly liberal values, at least by Humer's definition of liberalism. So, of course, hunter-gatherers tend to be extremely violent towards out-groups, right? So they're often at war with other groups. Sometimes entire societies would be exterminated. But within hunter-gatherer groups, relatively egalitarian norms are common. Uh, they actively resist political hierarchies, so group decisions would be made by consensus, not by a leader ordering people around. Indeed, what you tend to find in a lot of hunter-gatherer groups is that anybody who attempts to dominate others would be ridiculed and shunned. Um, it's sometimes called a reverse dominance uh, strategy. Um, hunter-gatherer groups tend to enforce sharing of resources, so each person is entitled to enjoy the benefits of the group. Um, and, you know, although outright gender equality is rare, the position of women was much better in many hunter-gatherer societies than for than it was in many civilized societies. Um, uh, I mean, of course, it's I mean very hard to s sort of make any generalizations here, but uh, it's at least arguable that broadly speaking, it was better to be a woman in a hunter-gatherer society. It's probably better to be a woman in a hunter-gatherer society than in many civilized societies of the past. Um, so actually, now it looks like well, maybe there isn't this trend. Maybe in fact. Uh, there wasn't this just general trend towards liberalism. Maybe with the rise of civilization, we actually saw um, a, a, a decline in liberal values, at least up until relatively recently. Um, also consider, for instance, race. Arguably, attitudes towards race became increasingly discriminatory and oppressive with the development of scientific racism in the 18th and 19th century. Now, of course, humans have always been tribalistic. Uh, there are plenty of antecedents to the idea of race in ancient history. But prior to the modern period, physical and mental differences between human populations were often explained as a product of the differing environments in which those populations lived. It was relatively rare that entire populations would be judged to be inherently and unalterably inferior. In ancient Greece, for instance, uh, all non-Greeks were viewed as barbarians but they could change their status by adopting Greek culture, by becoming more Greek, right? So like if you, you, could, you could adopt the culture and then lose your barbarian status. With scientific racism, humanity was divided into fundamentally and unalterably different groups. Differences were explained not simply by environmental influences or by culture, but primarily by genetics. So so these other groups were seen as inherently inferior, as incapable of acquiring civilized culture. Indeed, one popular model of human development was polygenism, which proposed that different races have different origins. Whites and blacks are quite literally separate species. Um, and, you know, in line with this, although slavery has been practiced throughout human history, the system of chattel slavery that developed in the Atlantic slave trade was particularly brutal. Um, you know, relative to at least some other <laughs> systems of slavery. So, you know, we might argue that the trend towards liberalism is not as clear or as universal as humour suggests. Um, I mean, again, this has been extremely brief, uh, and, like, there's there's a lot that I imagine could be said on this, and I'm no expert uh, when it comes to the uh, history on this stuff. Um, but this is just one point where people could object. Um, so the, the point then is, yes, the modern world does exhibit these strongly liberal values, but when you look at the history, you might end up thinking that this isn't so much the culmination of a uh, 
long-term global trend, but it's it's more like a sudden brief aberration. Um, so, you know, yes, that's uh, that's 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 one uh, way we might object to Hume's argument. But suppose that we object that we accept the empirical claim that there has been convergence on liberal values. Well, even so, there are numerous ways an anti-realist might account for this. One important point raised by Jerome Hopster in the article explaining historical moral convergence is that over time there has been increasing interaction between different cultural groups. So there's a trend towards globalization. Cultures in general are interacting more frequently and becoming homogenized. So with colonialism and imperialism, various aspects of Western culture were exported to other countries, or sometimes violently imposed upon other countries. As a result, Western ideologies spread across much of the world. Um, and then when colonized peoples fought for their independence, uh, they found that they shared mutual goals. And this created um, ever tighter links between different peoples, either through independence movements taking inspiration from one another or through independence movements directly aiding each other. So I mean th think about for instance how you know the American Revolution inspired the French Revolution or the establishment of the Soviet Union inspired similar Marxist movements in developing countries such as Cuba, Burkina Faso and Grenada um, and then the Soviet Union actually provided aid to such countries. Um, so you know we find like you know, countries sort of interacting with each other um, in all sorts of ways, sometimes sometimes violently, sometimes forcing their ideologies on each other, sometimes they're aiding each other. But, you know, all of this um, is going to kind of result in a, a spread of, um, of ideologies and practices. Uh, today, we've seen the development of many international unions and alliances, the United Nations, the EU, NATO, CARICOM, superpowers have always influenced smaller states using a variety of sort of soft power techniques. Um, furthermore, as a result of open trade and more efficient technology, people all over the world are exposed to media that's produced in liberal democracies. Some measure of the degree of cultural interchange can be seen in the fact that English is an official language in 59 countries, including India, Pakistan, the Philippines and Kenya. Um, so you know, these, these are places that would have had very different cultures in, in the past, you know, but you sort of come to, you know, uh, come to uh, the modern world and uh, now they share at least, you know, at least one language is counted as an official language in all of these very different countries. Um, one significant aspect of shared culture is the spread of modern technology. So since the Industrial Revolution, the entire globe has transitioned from, you know, craft production to the mechanized factory system. It led to massively increased economic output, a population boom and urbanization. It resulted in enormous changes in day to day life. And many of these changes occurred in almost all countries. The Industrial Revolution was then followed by the Digital Revolution and the Information Age, which again has spread rapidly across the globe. Now, surely it's unsurprising that these changes in social structure and technology would lead to changes in moral attitudes. So the point is that there has been convergence with respect to a variety of non-moral beliefs and practices. But if moral attitudes are strongly influenced by one's culture, and this is something that both the realist and the anti-realist accept, right? We, everybody accepts that moral attitudes are strongly influenced by one's culture. Then surely we should expect that non-moral convergence would lead to moral convergence. So, I mean, imagine two societies, each of them living on a separate island. Nobody in either society communicates with the other. They've developed independently for a long time, so they have different languages, different beliefs, different religious rituals, different culinary tastes, different moral values. Then one day, somebody builds a bridge from one island to the next. Members of the two societies start mixing. They trade, they learn from each other. People start traveling from one island to the other to work or to pursue relationships. What would we expect in this situation? Well, I, I mean, it seems pretty obvious that what we'd expect is that over time, the beliefs and practices of the two societies would start to converge, and that would include moral convergence. 
We don't need moral facts to explain this, just cultural exchange. So, um, so one way of explaining convergence is <clears throat> to point out that there's been a lot of non-moral convergence. Of course, that still leaves the question of, well, why, why liberalism specifically? Um, why not, uh, you know, any, any other of the possible moral views? Well, one answer to this is given by Nathan Kofnus in his article, A Debunking Explanation for Moral Progress. Uh, he actually suggests several factors that drive convergence towards liberal values specifically. Um, I will just note two of them, but I mean, he, he suggests more, but you know, uh, I'm just gonna, gonna go through two. So <clears throat> the first point he raises is that liberal values are in the self-interest of members of oppressed groups. Um, I mean, this is kind of obvious, right? When black people were being enslaved, it was clearly in the self-interest of black people to convince the rest of society that they were worthy of equal moral consideration. Um, so just generally speaking, right, people prefer to live in peaceful cooperative societies. They prefer to be free to pursue their own plans for life. They prefer to be accorded the same rights and respect as other people, or at least they prefer not to be treated worse than other people. I mean, maybe they would like to have more rights than other people. Um, maybe that would be ideal, but certainly they prefer not to be treated worse. Um, so, it, you know, in that sense, liberalism is in, is in each person's self-interest. It's certainly in the self-interest of the oppressed groups. Maybe it's not so much in the self-interest of the oppressor groups, but certainly it's in the self-interest of the oppressed groups. Now, importantly, people do not wait passively for oppression to stop. They actively resist it. Uh, now, people will submit to oppression for all kinds of reasons, but if they have the opportunity to seize power and liberty, they'll generally take it. People push back against what they see as unjust hierarchies. They will protest, sometimes violently. They will cause disruption. They will try to elicit sympathy from members of the elite groups. Um, and moreover, people who are low in, in social hierarchies have tended to comprise large portions of the population. Women have always comprised half the population. Black people comprised about a fifth of the US population in the early 1800s. The poor have, have always comprised the majority of the population. So, you know, in hierarchical societies, power and wealth is concentrated in the hands of a few, but there's also power in numbers, and this means that it takes constant effort to oppress people. You know, the victims are always going to advocate for themselves wherever they can, so there's always some internal pressure on societies to adopt liberal values, because, well, simply because members of those societies do not want to be victims of violence or discrimination. A second factor driving liberal values is increasing wealth and resource access. So it's plausible that poverty conditions will tend to lead to violence. When you're living at a subsistence level, gaining resources and protecting your resources is literally a matter of life and death. And that makes competition much more severe. You need to project aggression and violence in order to protect the resources that you do have to discourage others from stealing from you or defrauding you. But as society becomes more prosperous, well, you know, violence just isn't, it's just not so necessary. It's just not really required so much anymore. It doesn't matter so much if you, uh, if you lose your resources for one thing, um, because it's, it's just easier to acquire, uh, you know, resources to replace them. Like it doesn't matter if, if somebody come was to steal my food or something. I mean, you know, who cares? I, I wouldn't mind. Uh, if somebody was to steal my computer, well, I might mind that, but it wouldn't be a disaster. Um, I, I could, uh, you know, uh, buy a new computer. I mean, I'd feel the pain of it. I wouldn't like doing that, but you know, again, it's not, not the end of the world. That's not how things are when you're living in like outright poverty, um, when you're at a subsistence level. Um, similarly, social institutions become stronger as well. So educational institutions become better at enforcing norms against violence. The legal system becomes better at policing crime so that people are no longer required to settle grievances on their own. Um, people are no longer required to act aggressively to deter theft or fraud because they can rely on the legal system to 
do that for them. Um, moreover, increasing wealth means improved medical technology and healthier living conditions. Infant mortality rates decline, disease prevention improves, an increasingly large proportion of the population gains access to medical care. So as wealth increases, people are exposed to less death, less harm for most of their lives um, than they were before. Uh, consider that in the 1600s, half of all people died before adulthood. So for most of human history, death was commonplace. I mean, it's just a, it's just, just a normal part of life. Today, uh, you know, we don't, death is something that happens in old age. Um, so we're much more sensitive to death and harm than we once were. And as a result, we're much more sensitive to violence. So basically the point is, the, the, the general summary then is, increasing wealth means that violence is not so required. And it also means that we have less exposure to death. Uh, and so it's no surprise that our values will change to reflect this so that we adopt increasingly strong norms against violence. Um, and again, this doesn't require appealing to moral facts. It's just a matter of the way that cultures tend to change, um, you know, like as a result of the kind of self-interest of members of the culture uh, or as a result of increasing wealth. Um, OK, then, a fourth objection concerns the moral realists epistemology. We saw that humour tries to piggyback knowledge of moral facts on our knowledge of other a priori domains. The same faculty that allows us knowledge of mathematics and logic also allows us knowledge of the moral facts. But in fact, there appears to be a significant disanalogy between these domains. Uh, again, this is pointed out by um, Jerome Hopster. So Hopster says, look, if humour if humor were right, what we would expect to find is, and I quote, throughout the course of history, small groups of moral experts who defend and debate non-obvious moral claims. But in fact, what we find is that changes in moral attitudes are driven by large interest groups pushing for their rights. So you think of civil rights, gay rights, women's rights. It's, it's like, it's, it's just people. It's like normal people. It's large groups of normal people pushing for their rights. Um, and interestingly, it's often that these groups will push for consideration before intellectuals like moral philosophers converge on the relevant moral views. Uh, gay people were pushing for gay rights long before moral philosophers reached a consensus in favour of gay rights. So if you think about changes in our beliefs about you know, mathematics or logic or probability theory, well, the changes in belief here are driven by experts. Um, these changes in belief are driven by professionals who work in institutions who have devoted their lives to studying these topics. Sometimes just a single individual working on some problem will be responsible for a new discovery. They produce a proof and then this discovery spreads to other experts. It takes much longer for the discovery to spread to laypersons. Indeed, most of the discoveries in these fields have have just not reached the common person at all. Uh, in everyday reasoning, most people still um, make inferences that were long ago identified as fallacies by the relevant experts. So in, you know, in domains like mathematics and logic, what we tend to find is that experts uncover the facts first, then sometimes, if we're lucky, the rest of society comes to see these facts. Um, but changes in moral attitudes don't exhibit this pattern. The success of gay rights, for example, that wasn't the result of some moral expert reasoning through a conundrum and then finding a proof or an argument that it's morally wrong to discriminate on the basis of sexual orientation. It was more the result of gay people and allies of gay people protesting for their rights. Um, so if the same capacity is responsible for our beliefs in, you know, both, say, mathematics and morality, what explain, like, why is there this difference? What explains this difference? Um, that seems a bit puzzling. Um, okay, that's the end. Uh, the end of that. So thank you for watching. Goodbye. <clears throat>